Hello and welcome to chapter 19 of Nancy Goodame, the Space Ranger. This chapter is being recorded at the side of the road, so my apologies for any background noise if you can hear it. In any case, chapter 19, a hen, a door, tree, and away we go. At Scrumptolian eight and a quarter, Martian time, or sometime after dawn, but well before dusk, Jupiterian time, on the third day of the first crude human mission to another planet, in the Forest of Proverbs, on the bank of a stream, on Jupiter, were three Jupiterians, two Martians and two humans. They were united by varying degrees of dislike for a malicious interplanetary overlord named Sazman Borkstapple and walking downstream. The spectrum of dislike ranged from mild annoyance and an urge to remonstrate to demented anger and an urge to eviscerate. European Space Agency mission specialist Nancy Goodame McGinley was in the mild annoyance part of the spectrum. Her European Space Agency colleague Bart McMurrow felt the same. A Martian sheriff and a Martian waiter slash astronaut called Martina Ruddlesplitch wished to do severe harm to Sosman Borkstapple and make it impossible, or at the very least undesirable, for him and his Sosniak followers to do any more damage on Mars. The three Jupiterians Gumgulliger Unterwackel, aka Bip, Mercador O'Jumblon and Mjachta Flart were of the opinion that the best thing to do would be to cause Sosman Borkstapple unspeakable pain before ending his life and completely demoralising his supporters. I'd gouge out his nongular phenondrums with an auger. Well, you need to be quick because I'm going to take this homgodlian axe and whack it up his... What are you talking about, lads? asked Bart. Mercador and Mjachta were doing the talking. Bip was doing the leading and Bart, Nancy, the sheriff and Martina were doing the following. Oh, just the best way of killing Sosman. Right. I wouldn't put too much thought into it. Plans like that never work out, said Bart. How would you know? asked Nancy. She'd been listening to the conversation too, but had seen enough of Marketer and Myakta's behaviour to take what they said with a pinch of salt, or, more accurately, to try to ignore it. Which was difficult, as they were in a close group rapidly moving together under branches and over boulders as the stream wound its way along. Ah, I don't know, replied Bert. I just thought saying something like that might shut them up. They're a bit of a dose, those two. No offence, lads, but if you're so good at fighting, then how come you did nothing when Bip was laying into you earlier? Because, said Myakta, Bip is an old friend. He may be stupid, selfish, spiteful, bitter, narrow-minded, arrogant and um, stupid, but he is, or was, or is again, a member of the Hobla Graniker Defence League. And I'd burst the philundrum residue from both of your snouts, shouted Bip. And you said stupid twice, so that says more about you than me. Myakta said stupid twice. I didn't say it any times. Although, anyone would have to be a bit thick not to like the travelling show about the dragon Blardan. Mercator turned to Myakta as he walked, nodded, and then looked at Nancy, who shrugged, and then Bip who had turned his head backwards long enough to make sure Mercador saw that he had his axe unholstered with the flat edge of the blade facing his two Hobblegranger Defence League colleagues. I said anyone, Gumgolger. So, unless you're anyone, I wasn't talking about you, added Mercador. I was, said Myakta. Shh, shushed Nancy. Something about the place they were walking through seemed familiar, and something within that familiarity seemed out of place. Nancy could not say for definite, but something was wrong. What are you shushing us for? asked Bart. Well, other than shutting the Jupiterian numpties up for a while. Something's not right. Something's not right. Something's not right. We were the first humans to set foot on Mars, and now we're on Jupiter, minus our spaceship, with a waitress and a fat dope of a sheriff and a trio of Jupiterian simpletons looking for a dickhead of a commander who, if we ever find him, which doesn't seem likely, would be as much use to us as a handbrake in a canoe in getting back to Earth. Shh. Shushed Nancy for a second time. I am not fat, noted the sheriff. If you want to wrestle with me, you'll find out fairly quickly that this is 18 rovalized cubitons of martial muscle and bone. So let that be the end of that discussion once and for all. Unless you want to feel pain. Shh. Shushed Nancy for a third time. Nancy looked around her. Bip was leading the group, followed step in step by Morkader and Myakta. Martina and the sheriff were side by side behind the Jupiterians, and Bart was in front of Nancy. Apart from the stream and the rocks and boulders on its banks, the only other visible thing was the Jupiterian flora. It's the trees, she said. What? asked Bart. They're moving. The trees are moving. Everybody stop, she shouted. The group stopped in their tracks. Bip, Myakta, Morkador, Martina, the Sheriff and Bart all turned to face Nancy. She was looking back upstream and pointing at the trees along the left bank. Trees sometimes do that, Nancy explained the sheriff. It's the effect of planetary air circulation on their physical properties. No, I mean they're following us. Bip, Morkler and Myakta all holstered and raised the small axes that they had strapped to the side of their slightly ragged orange boiler suits. Which ones, Nancy? asked Bip. I, I don't know, but I swear there are trees moving along next to us behind the ones there on the edge of the bank. 
Nancy gestured to the vegetation on the right bank of the river. Thunk! Bip's axe flew through the air and slammed into the trunk of a tree beside her. It was followed by the axes of Markadar and Myakta. All three Jupiterians ran and retrieved their axes. This meant that Bip, Markadar and Myakta were now standing on the shingle bank between the stream, Nancy and the forest. Bart, Martina and the sheriff were a few metres further downstream on the same bank. Hobblerong! shouted Bip. We know you are there! His shout got no response. Well continued Bip. If you're not going to show yourself, then sneak off to your buddy Sazman Barkstapple and tell him the Hobble of Defence League is coming for him. His follow-up shout got no response either. Who are you shouting at? asked the sheriff. The wizard Hobblerong. This wouldn't be the first time he dressed himself up as a tree. Bip flung his freshly retrieved axe at the trunk of another nearby tree and retrieved it again. Are you sure you saw the trees move, Nancy? Nancy strained her eyes, looking into the forest. She'd been sure she saw the trunk of one or more of the trees moving in step with the group. Well, she had been very sure. But now, with the eyes of Bip, Morker, Myak, and Martina, Bart, and the Sheriff on her, she felt a tinge of doubt in her sense of something being out of place. Um, she said, I thought there was something. It's just like something doesn't seem right about this place. Bip raised his axe to throw it again and slowly flashed the blade at the vegetation in front of him. It is your first time at Jupiter, he said, so you could be wrong. Though you've been right about almost everything so far, except the halubleberries. You picked them for me. Doesn't mean you weren't wrong to eat them, said Bart. I don't know where you went to school, Mr. Bart, but here on Jupiter it's a bit rude not to eat a breakfast that has been offered to you. What exactly did you see, Nancy? continued Bip. I saw trees moving. After a feed of hallucinogenic mush that could have killed you. On Jupiter, you're doing well if that's all that's strange, said Bart. Bart is right, said the sheriff. It is not an unusual or strange thing to see trees move. They often do that type of thing. As I explained to everyone earlier, that is the effect of planetary air circulation on their physical properties. That's what it is, you know. Fortunately, we don't have that problem on Mars. Bit flung his axe at a third tree and retrieved it for a third time. Anyways, he said, it's good to keep alert. That wizard is sneaky. It would not be beyond him to track along with us to see what secrets he could overhear and whisper back to Borkstapple. It's the kind he is. A slithering, slimy, tattletailing sleeveen. A spineless, sneaky sleeveen. A slithering, slimy, spineless, sneaky, smelly sleeveen. There came a burst of green plasma from just beyond the tree line. Two trees transformed into the form of a stage magician and a small man holding a book. The magician hovered upwards inside the plasma. Bip, Markadar and Myakta all threw their axes. All three fell harmlessly to the ground once they reached the cloud of plasma. Nancy quickly and silently loaded her crossbow. I am not smelly, yelled the magician. Nobody responded. Nancy lifted her crossbow and took aim at the cloud. Something told her to wait, that the time was not yet right for a shot. And if I was, it would be because I don't have anyone to watch my jocks for me. The magician hovered about three metres above the ground. He was above the forest floor vegetation and just inside the tree line that flanked the right bank of the stream. The small man man holding the book was standing on the ground to the right side of the cloud of plasma. Nancy, Bart, Martina and the sheriff were standing facing the cloud containing the magician. Bip, Morkada and Myakta were creeping towards where their axes had fallen, which was just as the shingle bank turned to forestry and between the magician and the Martian and human visitors. They're trying to fetch their axes, Oblerong, yelled the small man with the book. I know that well, shot. I can see further than you can from up here and they are wasting their time. The magician turned to face Nancy, Bart, Martina and the sheriff. Can you smell me? He asked. Because I think Gumgolgar, Unterwackel and his two dimwit assistants are just trying to make me feel bad about myself. In fact, I'm sure of it. I don't know why I asked. I don't smell. There is a bit of a hum around here that wasn't there before you arrived, noted the sheriff. Well, well, I'd like to sniff how you'd be if you had nobody to wash your underwear for you. It wouldn't be very nice. I can tell you that much. Bip, Morker and Myakta had almost reached the edge of the trees and the spot where their axes lay when the wizard extended a hand towards them. A bolt of green light shot from his hand, causing all three to stand bolt upright and vibrate rapidly. Nancy felt an urge to do something and that urge told her to unleash a bolt from her crossbow into the small man which she did. Both travelled rapidly and cleanly towards the small man and found a home in his throat so that the tip and shaft were buried and only the feathers remained visible. The small man shook briefly, buckled at his knees and fell backwards. He dropped the book he had been carrying. The book of Bongerlon! yelled the magician slash wizard Oblerong. He dropped slowly to the ground and carefully picked up the book, cradling it in his arms. Now look what you did! Wait till Sazman Barksapple hears about this. First, you refused to wash my underpants, and now you kill the only person able to read the book of Bongerlong! You, 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 you sobering habalong of a gleaver! Excuse my language. Nancy rapidly reloaded and unleashed another bolt in the direction of the wizard. He waved his left hand and the projectile flew from its course and off into the vegetation along the bank of the 
the stream. Nancy knew not to reload again and lowered her weapon. The sheriff raised his unloaded weapon. Unmagic those Jupiterians, you fiend! He yelled. He then took another look at his crossbow and began fumbling for a bolt to put in it. The wizard began crying. Bip, Morgana and Myakta continued upright vibrating. Martina looked at the sheriff. What does the gust think about all this? She asked. Good question, replied the sheriff. Nobody move and I'll ask him, he added. The sheriff then tilted his head sideways with his eyes closed. The three Jupiterians continued vibrating. The wizard stood up, dried his tears, looked towards Nancy and pointed to the sheriff. What is that fat idiot doing, he asked. Release our friends from whatever it is you have done to them. Only if you tell me what that man is doing. He's having a chat with the gut, explained Martina. Inside his head. He can talk to the gut. This is incredible. What are they talking about? Oh, just a general chat, I think. He wanted to see what the creator of the universe makes of what you did to Bip, sorry, Gumgaller, Mark or a Myakta. Nancy turned to face Martina. She gave her the sternest look she could manage. Martina didn't seem to care, or possibly she didn't notice. What are you telling the wizard that for, Martina? I was about to get him to release those Jupiterians from whatever spell they were under. The three of them look like they're in extreme pain. Sorry, Nancy, I just thought it's best to be honest when it comes to speaking about the gut. Not telling him wouldn't have been a lie. Ah, oh, the lot of you are gone nuts, noted Bart. I am not, exclaimed the sheriff. I was speaking to the gut, which is just about the sanest thing a Martian could do. The same probably goes for Jupiterians. I'm not sure about humans, though. Rumour is your lot prefer science. But you know what they say about humans. You can talk to the gut. I mean, can you talk to the gut? Just like that? Whenever you want? Asked the wizard Obleron. He can, replied Martina. I was asking the fat idiot. Not you, washerwoman, snapped the wizard. I am not fat or an idiot. Could an idiot know the answer to this? How many cubitons of length are excavation machines permitted to be driven from the historical boundary of a basmical mine on Mars? What? Asked the wizard. Exactly, said the sheriff. The answer is 14, measured from a point perpendicular to the line of exit from that boundary. So now, who is the idiot now? Do you talk to the gut? Yes. W would you join forces with me so we can defeat the enemies of Sazman Borkstapel? I thought there was only three left, but it looks like that fellow Gub Golliger has been importing them. So I could do with a hand from the creator of the universe. You know, to do away with them all. Hmm... Would there be payment? The wizard stood up and placed the Book of Bongolon under his right arm. He drew an imaginary circle in the air with his left hand and pointed to the tree canopy. The eyes of Bart Martin and the sheriff looked to where he was pointing but saw only branches and leaves. Nancy did not look up but made use of the momentary distraction to reload her crossbow. Something told her to be ready. The sheriff shrugged his shoulders. Does that mean there would be payment? He asked. Of course there's payment, snapped Oblerong and then drew another imaginary circle before pointing his left arm upwards for a second time. The circle, which means everything and the sky I'm pointing out which means the star's the limit I am a wizard for Obligong's sake I can magic any material goods you desire I gave you a very simple gesture explaining this he said it may be simple for a Jupiterian but my Martian mind is far more advanced so it takes me time to lower my comprehension to your primitive hand waving wizard but I take your point I will also take all that you can magic so my answer is yes I will great then it's settled the wizard then took the book of Bongolon and threw it into the stream guess I won't be needing that tome anymore not now that I have a servant who can talk directly to the gut. Hang on, I'm nobody's servant, said the sheriff. Yes, you are, fat man, you are my servant, and you should be honoured to be so. The sheriff clumsily fumbled with a crossbow bolt, gave up, dropped the crossbow, and charged across the eight or so metres to where the wizard was standing. The wizard held out both his palms towards the sheriff, and a green cloud of plasma formed in front of them. The effect of this knocked the sheriff backwards onto his arse. The wizard strode forwards and slapped the stunned sheriff across his face. The cheek of you! I can see now why Sosman hates Martians, he said. Nancy let fly with a bolt from her crossbow, which caught the wizard in his arm and sent him spinning and dancing in pain. Run, she said. Where to? asked Bart. Anywhere, she yelled. Follow me. Then she began sprinting towards the tree line. She paused her escape at the lifeless body of the small Book of Bongolon translating wizard servant known as Schlock, yanked her well-targeted crossbow bolt from his neck and yelled, Run! for a second time. Bart followed her. Martina followed Bart. And the sheriff struggled to his feet and followed Martina. What about the Jupiterians? yelled Martina. There's nothing we can do for them now replied Nancy. And so it was for late afternoon on the third day of the first human crewed mission to another planet. Three spellbound vibrating Jupiterians known as Gum Gulliger, Underwackle Marketer or Jumblon and Myakta Flart who together made up the Hobblegranger Defence League. One dancing about in pain wounded Jupiterian wizard called Oblaron, two fleeing European Space Agency mission specialists, one fleeing Martian waitress slash astronaut, one fleeing Martian sheriff and a sopping wet book of Bongerlon floating its way downstream through a valley known as Polynasp in the Farce of Proverbs on Jupiter. And that was chapter 19. Fair play if you stuck through the whole lot of that. Uh, chapter 20 will be along next week. Chat to you then.